This week, as the first official objections to Dr. Beeching's plan to prune our railways are being heard at Harrogate, so the National Council of Inland Transport is intensifying its attacks against the plan in general. The Council's chairman is Lord Sonham, the Labour life peer. On the 22nd of June, Lord Sonham said that if the country was to have an efficient transport system, the beaching myth must be exploded. And he made reference to what he called the phony figures on which the report was based. A few weeks later, at the end of July, Lord Stonham claimed that the government and British Railways were engaged in a conspiracy to defraud the public of an essential public transport system and claimed that there was no effective appeal machinery for any local authority or member of the travelling public to register his protest. Three weeks later, the unrelenting life peer claimed that the figures supplied by the railway board gave a completely false picture of branch line finances. On August the 16th, Dr. Beeching delivered a fierce counter-attack, claiming that Lord Stonham was deceiving the public and that the Council for Inland Transport was completely unrepresentative of transport interests in the country. The country, said Dr. Beeching, had made a general decision to reorganise its railways in a sensible way, but was busy frustrating its intention by listening to people like Lord Stonham. Immediate retaliation. The statement of an angry man, said Lord Sonham, a man who has been confronted with facts he cannot answer and therefore resorts to abuse. Lord Sonham asked Dr Beeching to quote any specific examples of systematic and deliberate distortion, in which case, Sonham said, I will be prepared to answer them, preferably face to face. Well, here they are tonight, face to face. Lord Sonham, you say that the figures on which the report is based are phony. Now, how can you justify this charge? Well, actually, I don't say that they're all phony, and I want to make a distinction between what I regard as phony figures and figures which, although correct, are misleading in the manner of their presentation. Mm -hmm. Now, with regard to phony figures, first I would say that you've based vital conclusions on uh, a survey uh, which was taken in one only week in April 1961. That's an off-peak week uh, for many areas, particularly holiday resorts, where um, in summer, there are a hundred times as many passengers, literally, as on an average day in winter. And those uh, resorts are threatened uh, with the loss of their railway lines. That's one category. The second, and I think the more important, is this. On page 16 of your report, uh, you give details of the economics of lightly um, used railways. And you give it as an example, a line with fully manned stations and signals and 224 uh, trains a week. And uh, from that, uh, you uh, say how much a mile uh, that line would cost if, if the trains had four passengers per train. Now, Dr. Beeching, there isn't a single line in this country with 224 trains a week uh, running every hour on the hour from 7 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night and with uh, four passengers a week and with a, a full cost service. And if there is, uh, then it's your fault. And I say that those uh, figures are phony and unreal until you get to the point of 6,000 passengers a week. But well, let's examine some of these. Dr. Yes, May I take that from there? First of all, that our figures are phony and misleading. Uh, in uh, support of this claim, you uh, mentioned just four points, I think. You first of all pointed out, uh, not today, but in your previous publications, uh, you point out that there's a printer's error on page 16, that we've got two shillings where it should be tuppence. Now, there are, in fact, printer's errors in some uh, editions of the Bible, but it doesn't invalidate it, does it? So well, that's one point that you've sense. made. Now let's come to this uh, example that you've mentioned. Uh, no, let, uh, let me go back, because I've missed one of your points. You say that we took this survey, uh, on one week's traffic and we base vital conclusions on it. Now that isn't true, and I'm sure you know it isn't true, because I'm sure you've been told that it's not so. What we did was to do a survey of traffic over one week in order to get a broad picture and in order to focus our attention in the right places. We then examined all these lines in very much greater detail and certainly no proposal with regard to closure or modification of service is based upon the one-week survey. Not only is that true, but you know it to be true. If I may, now coming to these examples, what we did on page 16 was to show a table 
uh, of examples extending over a very wide range of traffics, various forms of transport and various conditions of service in order that anybody with reasonable intelligence could do any calculation they wished for themselves. And the lowest level of traffic covered in this table was a thousand passengers a week. And the density of service was this 224 trains a week. Now you regard it as ludicrous that we should have uh, any service with only a thousand passengers, four people per train, not per week, Lord Stonham, but per train. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we have got some services. Now you say if we have, it's my fault that we have. Quite right. I'm proposing to close them down. Oh, no. That, that you, you are deliberately uh, dodging the point. What I said is there's no service with 224 trains a week and less than a thousand passengers a week. But that I, is the point, not that there are I trains with... I was dodging the point. I was saying there are such services. Ah, yes. As you could have found out yourself if you compared the passenger density maps with the published timetable. You say, and you've said several times, until now obviously you're convinced that no, it's true, I, that there aren't any such no, services. But in fact there are. You further say that if there are, it's my fault, I ought to close them down. That is precisely what we're doing. Ah yes, but there's a difference between scratching your head and tearing it to pieces. What I am saying is that there are no such lines with a full service and that number of trains still running with only four passengers uh, uh, per train. Uh, certainly, however, you could have a reduced service related uh, to the number of passengers to be carried. And uh, I said, you are saying that, but it isn't in fact true. I have said that there are such services. Now, looking to your own particular publication, uh, preparing a case for objection, you give an example where there are in fact, if I can add up these figures, and it's very difficult to add them up because they're not presented in such a way as to enable anyone to add them up, but doing my best, I arrive at the conclusion that there are less than a thousand passengers a week on this service and you're proposing to run a hundred and ninety odd trains so that isn't it quite natural that where we have a similar density we find ourselves well, running 224? I can tell you that there are very many more passengers than a thousand a week. But Could I just, well, why didn't you say so in that case? You really are getting, uh, getting away from, from, from the uh, point here, you know. Well, and I think you know you're getting away and you're trying to uh, talk it out. Let's move on from this point, point. anyhow. Indeed, I'm trying we? to stay on the point. Dr. Beaton, you claim that Lord Sonham's council is um, totally unrepresentative of transport interests in this country, as unrepresentative as any as you could find, you say. Do you uh, think, not think this is perhaps a little unfair? Oh, no, by no means. I don't think it's at all unfair. Uh, I see that Lord Stonham says that it's distressing that I should say so. I think that it can only be distressing because it deflates his pretensions to represent <laughs> a national body, because uh, clearly he can't be surprised. Well, Stonham. Well, uh, we certainly represent on, on a national scale those who use transport. I don't know whether Dr. Beeching disregards uh, uh, their needs. Our corporate members uh, uh, cover affiliations of some 150 local authorities from county down to uh, rural district councils and they stretch from Land's End to John of Groats and more are joining every day. We have nine trade unions including the National Union of Railroad, Transport Salaried Staffs Association, the Siemens Union, that's coastal shipping, uh, even the um, but you don't represent Scottish coastal shipping, do you? Uh, well, we think it has an affiliation, even if you don't, uh, yeah. with inland transport. Yes, indeed. Uh, and um, even the Scottish horse and, and, and motor men. We have many firms with large transport road fleets, and every national association throughout the country concerned uh, with, with the use of uh, roads, the railways, uh, the waterways, uh, and the countryside. Indeed, our representation would be 100% if only British Railways and the Road Federation would join, and they can do so if they agree uh, to sign the Council's policy, which is for an integrated uh, uh, transport service. But above all, uh, Dr. Beeching, we represent the British people. My uh, post desk every morning now is, is stacked a, a foot high with letters from people who are 100% bitterly and anxiously opposed to the loss of their rail service. You know, it's not tins of paint or rolls of terror, but human beings we're dealing with, Mr. and Mrs. John Bull. And my well, shall, I, shall, shall I answer this point now, no, Lord Stonham, because it. you might go on forever with your no, tins of paint and the, it the it rolls sound, of terror. I, I, I finish with those. Well, I, sorry, I, let's just move on. Let's give Dr. Beeson a chance to deal with I the points they raised so far. Well, now, you say you're representative, that you have a representation from all the major users of transport, but you've got nobody representative of industry. 
uh, you, have, you have a scatter of uh, firms, some of whom really don't know why they joined your organisation. Well, uh, they take 10 guineas for it. You say that you have uh, now 150 local authorities. When last I saw a published list of your corporate membership, you had four. But I accept that more have joined. But there are 1,929 uh, local authorities <laughs> above <laughs> parish council level <laughs> and thousands of parish councils, so that you have a trifle still. You have no representation of the major users of transport. You have no representation from industry on any scale at all. Well, that, that uh, you have, you have a, a representation from the unions, including, of course, the two royal unions. It's surprising that you haven't got the third, but then these things do happen. Do you all get they, them they all naturally on the same Not thing. always. Yeah, but but time, not alas, is slipping by very quickly. But well, I'd like to ask you finally each one question. Dr. Beeching, you accuse Lord Sonham of systematic and deliberate distortion. In a brief word, do you still stand by that? Yes, I do. Uh, if I've got uh, any time, Very briefly, I will give you a, a number of examples. He says, for example, that on the Shepherd's Well line in Kent, we show the traffic as less than 5,000 tonnes a week. He doesn't say a week, he implies that it's a year, and says that in fact it's 200,000 tonnes a year, and that this is cheating because we say it's 5,000. Now, if Lord Stonham can do arithmetic, he will work it out that 200,000 tonnes a year is less than 5,000 tonnes a week, which is precisely what we said. Similarly, on a line from Hastings to Tunbridge, he says that we say it's less than 10,000 tonnes a week, and that there are 400,000 tonnes of gypsum on the line. So there are. It's virtually all the traffic there is. That's 8,000 tonnes a week. It is less than 10,000 tonnes. It's just plain arithmetic. Mm. Lord Sonam, you've accused Dr. Beeching of being a worried man and not aware of much that is going on in British railways, particularly at top level. Are you still so convinced? Oh yes, I think if he hadn't been a very worried man, he wouldn't have made this extraordinary outburst last uh, Friday. And, uh, uh, gentlemen, reluctantly at this point, I must close the discussion. <laughs> Dr. Beeching, thank you very much. Lord